اللي قلت كذا فري هاوس مثل يعني ميرسي ميدسن مانجمنت ذن ذا مانجمنت جوز اون ذا اي سي يو اند تو هاف مور فوكس اون ذا سي بي بي مانجمنت اند ذا اي سي بي مانجمنت ريجاردنج ذا كلاسيفيكيشن وي هاف تو وايز تو كلاسيفاي ذا سوماتيك انجري باي ذا كلاسيكال واي يوزنج ذا جراس كوم سكور or more conventional way using the four score uh, for the gas coma score because uh, we are uh, familiar with the gas coma score so regarding the score of the, pre- uh, the presentation of the patient we have mild uh, traumatic brain injury between 13 and 15 moderate between 9 and 12 and severe 8 and below and regarding the, to the four score we'll have similar uh, classification Uh, this is uh, like an overview about the four score. So uh, either you can use both of them; they are all valid, and uh, they are all like uh, standardized between all uh, hospitals. So for the pathophysiology, we have uh, primary bra- brain injury and secondary brain injury. The primary brain injury is uh, at the time of the injury, and it results from the direct impact of the brain brain chyma. Secondary brain injury is a sequel from the primary brain injury. Uh, that means uh, all the other following injuries that could result from the primary brain injury. Uh, the primary brain injury, as I said, it's at the time of the trauma. Common mechanism include direct impact, rapid acceleration, deceleration, like what happens in a car accident, uh, penetrating injuries, and blast waves. Uh, although all these mechanisms uh, ha- could be considered as heterogeneous, They all result from external mechanical forces that translate it to the uh, brain parenchyma. Uh, for the prime brain injury, we have uh, diffuse axonal injury, which is multiple small lesion that is only shown uh, through neuroimaging, like CT or MRI. Uh, it results from the damage of the combination of contusion hematomas and tearing of the white matter tracts inside the brain. Usually, it results uh, with edema and swelling. And typically, uh, those patients with severe TPI present with coma, high intracerebral pressure, and often they have poor outcome, as it showed in uh, the image with the uh, diagram, uh, have like uh, hyper density with edema and poor differentiation. Uh, we have cerebral uh, contusion, which is the most frequent lesion, and usually uh, it's seen with any hit to the basal frontal areas and temporal areas. Uh, that being why, because they are more susceptible region for injuries and trauma, like a blood, a blunt force trauma, acceleration, deceleration. And usually it results from the disruption of the blood vessels that lead to contusion. Uh, we have extra axial injuries. Uh, we, uh, that means any injury outside the brain, uh, but within the skull, uh, you know, with, uh, within the brain matters, the P, arachnoid, and uh, dura. So we have uh, epidural hematoma, which is always associated with skull fracture, subdural hematoma, damage uh, to the bridging vein, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, with disruption of the P vessels. And we also have intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, these are images to show the differences between the epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma in the middle, and subarachnoid hemorrhage in the right side. Uh, please note that uh, almost one third of the patient with severe traumatic brain injury develop coagulopathy, which is uh, always associated with increased risk of hemorrhage, poor neurological outcome, and death. Uh, the, so that's why uh, whenever you have a patient with traumatic brain injury, careful history taking should be done regarding if the patient is taking any uh, anticoagulation, warfarin, or uh, any bleeding disorder that could uh, happen with the patient. So you could manage it uh, either, uh, further on. Secondary brain injuries, uh, which is, as I said, a cascade from the sequel of the primary brain injury, uh, which uh, also uh, lead from the neuronal cell death, uh, leading to cerebral edema, increase in ICP, and further exacerbate the primary brain injury. Uh, it have many forms, but the most common forms are uh, either electrolyte imbalance, inflammatory response that is uh, led by the cell death, so whenever the brain cell death Uh, happens, the body response by increasing the cytokines and primitive response, which exacerbate the uh, brain injury, and secondary ischemia from vasospasm or occlusion or vascular injury. So uh, we'll go now to the management. Uh, so pre-hospital management uh, with the goals of to prevent hypoxemia and prevent hypotension. 
uh, either by uh, face mask, neither cannula or uh, intubation, and prevent hypotension by giving fluid. And as we all know, uh, the, uh, the first choice in resuscitation for uh, any uh, neural, neural uh, patient is the normal saline 0.9. In the emergency medicine, uh, the goals of treatment uh, apply by the APLS protocol, ICP monitoring, and that's happened by uh, evaluating a patient examination from head to toe to look for any sign of increased ICP, uh, like uh, fixed dilated pupil, uh, respiratory depression, whatever. Uh, we have imaging, uh, CT scan is the modality of choice, and the role of tranexamic acid, which I will talk uh, later on. Uh, in the ICU, uh, the primary goals of ICU management is to prevent the secondary brain injury. And we'll talk about the uh, management of ICP and monitoring, either by medical management or surgical management. So for the tranexamic acid, as we all know, by the recent CRASH-3 trial, it showed that uh, for those with moderate uh, traumatic brain injury, i.e. the grass coma score between uh, 9 and 13, uh, or with any evidence of intracranial hemorrhage on CT, and within the three, uh, three hours of presentation, we'll give tranexamic acid. It's, it's one gram over 10 minutes, then one gram over 30 minutes. Now we go to the intensive care management. Uh, as we said, is, uh, the goal of the intensive care management is to prevent secondary brain injury. Uh, I will be talking details and regarding each aspect uh, of management and uh, ICU. So for the hemodynamic management, uh, regarding the fluid and electrolyte, we need to keep the patient eovolemic, not dehydrated, not uh, over hydration. Normal sign, as I said, is the preferred uh, choice over albumin due to the mortality benefit as shown in the SEP trial. And to correct any electrolyte imbalances, uh, and we should be vigilant in uh, uh, regarding the electrolyte correction. Blood pressure, uh, first goal is to avoid hypotension. Then uh, we see the age of the patient. If he's between 50 and 69 years of age, uh, our systolic blood pressure goal should be 100 and above. And if the patient is between 15 and 49 or more than 70 years of age, uh, will go up uh, with the systolic blood pressure to more than 110. Cerebral perfusion pressure, uh, our goal is to keep uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure, pressure between 60 and 70 to improve the survival. And as we know, the cerebral perfusion pressure uh, equal to the MAP minus the ICP. Ventilation management, our goal is to keep the patient fully sedated with the loss of score is zero to minus two, which improve the mortality, uh, mortality and morbidity. Avoid hypercarpia that leads to high ICP. And to avoid hypoxia with a target of PA2 more than 60, uh, hyperventilation uh, it used, used to be uh, one of the modalities to increase the ICP. However, recent studies show that it uh, leads to higher mortality and mor morbidity. So it's only used as a bridging measurement until ICP management, uh, definitive ICP management should be done, like either APD insertion or clinic trim. Uh, how, uh, also to be noted that if your patient uh, develop IRDS, it's okay and acceptable to reach PEEP as high as uh, 20 uh, centimeters of water uh, in a way to improve the oxygenation in these patients. EEG and anti-seizure drugs. Uh, anti-seizure drugs has been shown to reduce the incidence of uh, early seizure. However, it did not prevent later episodes. Levitricam or Kipra is the preferred uh, choice over phenytoin, especially in the first week of uh, admission. And also it has been shown to improve six months functional outcome in uh, traumatic brain injury when compared to phenytoin. EEG is recommended as a monitoring for these patients, especially if they have a subclinical seizure or if the patient is, uh, did not improve in their conscious level or their conscious uh, of the extent of the brain injury does not explain uh, the conscious level of this, these patients. So here we can use a continuous EEG to monitor these patients. DVT prophylaxis and coagulopathy. Uh, in the first 48 hours, it's recommended to use uh, mechanical DVT prophylaxis either by uh, pneumatic compression or elastic compression. However, uh, if there is no contraindication for DVT prophylaxis, Unfractionated heparin is uh, recommended and preferred over uh, enoxaparin. Uh, as we said, the coagulopathy is always associated with poor outcome and it's always uh, seen in traumatic brain injury. 
That's why we need good history taking. Uh, if the patient is on any uh, form of anticoagulation, we should reverse it. We could use uh, fish frozen plasma, PCC, vitamin K in a way to reverse any coagulopathy with a target INR of less than 1.4. Glucose and fever, as we know, uh, avoiding of hypo and hyperglycemia, especially in ICU patient, is a must. And with a targeting of uh, RBS of 140 to 180, uh, improvable mortality and morbidity in ICU patient. Avoiding fever as much as possible, because whenever there is a fever, to lead to high ICP by increasing the metabolic demand, blood flow, and blood volume. Uh, going to now to the uh, ICP management, uh, so uh, we have initial management that we can do uh, the first few hours uh, to the admission. I need to improvise measure then uh, ICP management and when, uh, when all these measurements uh, fail, what can we do for the patient to improve his uh, survivability. So for the initial management, uh, head elevation, uh, 30 to 45 degree and optimizing venous drainage. These simple measures can help and uh, minimize, uh, of course, the risk of aspiration, improve the venous drainage of the patient, and also keep the uh, neck uh, in neutral position, either by using a soft color or Philadelphia color. Temporizing measure, uh, as we said, only leave hyperventilation to target CO2 level of 30 until a, a definitive management of ICP will be done. However, it's not recommended more than 30 minutes to keep the patient hyperventilated at, it's associated with high mortality and morbidity. We can use uh, boluses of uh, osmotic agent like mannitol, one gram to 1.5 gram per kg, or uh, hypertonic uh, saline. In this situation, we can give 23.4 uh, normal saline, 30 to 60 ml over 10 minutes. Uh, it's usually uh, preferred to use the normal saline over mannitol to avoid any uh, hypovolemia associated with the mannitol. For the ICP management, our goal is uh, to be less or equal to 22 uh, millimercury uh, to improve the survival. Uh, the optimal way to control the uh, cerebral perfusion pressure I by ICP rather than elevating the map. Uh, that's by using the EVD drainage, and EVD drainage will be uh, it's recommended to be continuous than, rather than intermittent drainage. Uh, we can use uh, adjuvant osmotic therapy like mannitol or uh, hypertonic saline. As we said, that the hypertonic saline is preferred over mannitol uh, to prevent hypovolemia or volume depletion. If we are using the hypertonic saline, our goal of sodium is between 145 and 155 with uh, frequent serial sodium level measurement. And if we are using mannitol, uh, then we should uh, monitor the osmolality and should be uh, below 320 millimolar per day. When everything fails, we have decompressive craniectomy. Uh, this decision should be done uh, with the neurosurgery and the family because uh, although decompressive craniectomy improved the mortality of these patients, it always associates with uh, higher morbidity, so uh, uh, it's not an easy choice to be done. Uh, Barbiturate coma uh, is a way to uh, decrease the metabolic demand, decrease a cerebral blood flow, and which will increase the I decrease the ICP. And hypothermia, uh, according to the re recent literature, it's still under uh, study and there is a lot of debate regarding the use of hypothermia. So for now, it's not recommended unless the patient will be enrolled in a randomized control study. Uh, so uh, just a few points that should be remembered that proper sedation and analgesia is recommended by the recent guidelines. Uh, RAS score between zero and minus two to optimize the ICP control. Uh, the choice of sedation should be propofol, as it has been shown, uh, it will have neuroprotective agent with use of fentanyl as a preferred energetic agent. Always monitor the glucose and fever. Uh, keep the patient ergonomic, and there is no role of steroid in traumatic brain injury, as a recent study has been shown it will increase the mortality and morbidity in these patients. That's it. Thank you. Alin, uh, only a couple of uh, questions, that answers for questions that Dr. Abdelhadi asked, and I will comment. Uh, for regarding the uh, prophylactic anti epileptic medication, uh, and the latest recommendation of Brain Trauma Foundation, uh, it was not recommended to give a prophylactic anti epileptic medication, except in a couple of cases. Like we have the breast fracture with subdural hematoma. Uh, underneath it. If we have cortical contusion, yes, in these cases we can give. However, it's 
uh, case by case. Uh, and other uh, indication to start antiepileptic medication if the patient seized in the uh, scene. So these patients will have, they should be started on uh, antiepileptic medication. Yeah, and these cases are the only cases we start uh, David, uh uh, antiepileptic medication. Uh, the, as Tabit mentioned, yes, the guidelines right now is favoring Kibra uh, against uh, phenytoin because of the cogn later cognitive uh, impact or cognitive function uh, later on. Uh, the other thing is about the uh, about the mechanism of 3% or hypertonic saline and uh, manitol. As you mentioned, Dr. Uh, Abdul Hadi, the effect of manitol, why it is not favorable in patients with traumatic brain injury or with a trauma to start manitol because it will drop the blood pressure because it is it has a significant diuretic effect rather than 3%. Uh, it will increase the volume, yes, initially, but then with the diuresis, it will drop the blood pressure significantly and it will harm your patient with decrease the MAB and then the ICB will be higher than the MAB and that will decrease the cerebral perfusion pressure and that will be harmful. Uh, the, regarding the blood target, yes, in the, in the younger age you will have higher targets than in the age of 60s you will have lower targets and in the 70s, yes, you have higher targets. And that's because of the physiological changes that we will have with the blood, uh, with the blood vessels and with the skull. Uh, the other issue, uh, one of the slides you mentioned that the, the classification of uh, TBI uh, it is mild, moderate, severe, yes, regarding to the clinical. And we have also radiological criteria to, uh, to classify our patient. Uh, from the clinical point of view, uh, the guidelines right now is leaning towards that 14 and 15 only the mild. 13 up to 9 is the moderate and then uh, less than 8 or 8 and less is the severe. So only they are including right now in the mild uh, form of traumatic brain injury is the mild is the 15 and 14 patient of GCS, not 13. 13 is going to be a moderate patient, uh, a moderate uh, TBI patient. Uh, the as if we go to the management of these patients, as you mentioned, you have to stabilize them in the uh, scene or pre-hospital. Any hypotension or hypoxia at the scene will make will made the mortality rate higher, and it can doubles the mortality rate. Uh, the um, the second thing after that, you have to suspect any. You have to put in your mind any patient with TBI especially severe TBI or moderate to severe TBI, you have to rule out uh, spinal um, trauma or, or cervical trauma because it is associated in up to 25 to 30 percent of these patients will have uh, C-spine fractures, either stable or unstable fracture. But you will not harm, you, you don't take it easily and, um, and, and, and uh, don't stabilize the neck of the patient. If you want to transfer, this patient should be stable. The uh, C color should be applied. The patient should be have the log roll position, and uh, the hard um, the hard surface the should be uh, the, yeah the, the backboard should be applied. Um, uh, I think uh, and the rule of hypothermia, as you mentioned, the rule of hypothermia. It is till now several studies going back and forth, either favoring and unfavoring. The last study is not favoring, which is the Baller and the Utherm trial, not favoring hypothermia, except if patient they have intractable ICB and they were were not managed by the with the uh, with the regular. Uh, management but as a part of uh, traumatic brain injury with uh, blood with icb that can be managed surgically uh, there is no indication for that thank you dr Kofer. just uh, um, um, uh, a feedback about the hypothermia mm -hmm. uh, i worked like you know, in more than 20 years from now on um, uh, one of uh, with my, with one of my colleague at the thesis for uh, hypothermia and traumatic brain injury we didn't go for uh, um, hypothermia for the whole body. We will use certain uh, hamlet, and this is will uh, containing an irrigation of cold water. 
So we'll brain only, we, we, we go lower the temperature of the head of the patient only. And then we using a subclavian line and this subclavian line, we will send it um, uh, يعني, upside to um, the internal jugular vein. And um, 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 then we, we collect a sampling uh, of the ABG and see the oxygen extraction. And actually what I can remember that it doesn't show any benefit in morbidity or mortality at that time. But we work on it. So the hypothermia, because the, the logic thinking, it decreased the brain metabolism. So when it decreased the demand, whatever the supply decreasing based on the traumatic brain injury, if you the demand also in front of it decreasing, show the balance can be maintained. So I don't know uh, what is the future of this research, but at that time it was no, of no benefit at all yet. But I, I want to ask Dr. Akauthar the role of transcranial Doppler. I think it is very important topic. Yeah, to be, uh, yeah. Talking to about here. Here. Yes, uh, like for example, in the guidelines, if you go to the guidelines, they recommend ICB monitor for each patient who had uh, GCS of eight and less, if they have uh, with abnormal CT scan, or they have normal CT scan, but their uh, uh, examination is worrisome, like they have either posturing in the exam or their, their uh, systolic blood pressure is less than 90. These are by the guidelines recommendation to put patient on uh, ICB monitor. Uh, this is possibly, uh, this it is an inv and the ICB monitor, either EVD, which is the ventriculostomy, if you want to drain something, if, and or the intracranial monitor, if there is nothing to be drained. Uh, the uh, the issue with these two uh, approaches, they are uh, invasive. Uh, they carry the risk of uh, either hematoma formation, uh, infection, and the infection rate in the literature, it varies. And most of the literature, it's fall around seven to up to 25 in some literature. But most of the literature, seven to 10% is the infection rate. So uh, the issue with the, uh, that's the issue with the EVD and the intraparenchymal uh, monitor. Uh, that's why EVD could help, uh, I'm sorry, TCD could help us non-invasively and it is, it can uh, non-invasively to measure the, I, the ICB and to see that we have three, from the TCD point, we have three categories that can inform us about the functional outcome later on for this patient. For example, we have hyperemic part, uh, uh, oligemic uh, type, and we have the vasospasm type. And these uh, can give you a hint what is the prognosis of this patient and how to adjust your management according to which type. For example, if you have a patient with a traumatic brain injury and the TCD shows a PI of 1.25 and the uh, end diastolic velocity is a 25, this patient will have a higher risk to have um, high ICB later on and have a vasospastic uh, pattern and the complication of vasospasm later on, even if they are a traumatic brain injury. And these are the functional outcome of this patient will turn to be the worst outcome. Not the hyperemic, not the oligemic. The oligemic, you can change, you can, but they, you can uh, decrease the ICB, improve the perfusion, they will be better. The hyperemic, if they have hyperemia, like if they are anemic or they lost significant amount of blood or they are febrile, you control all of this, they will have good outcome. So the vasospasm part, uh, if you know it and you manage it uh, accordingly, your patient could have a better outcome. And this is the TCD. The TCD can give you the what is in a spot, what you can do for this patient, and what you can um, expect later on. Also with the TCD or let's say generally ultrasound, brain ultrasound, we can do uh, optic sheet nerve diameter. And it can give you the reflection of how much the ICB of this patient. So uh, I think you know that the in the adult, we have the variation up to 5.5 and 5.9. 
uh, as a normal and whatever what, whatever over that number it it could it could represent a high ICB or uh, dilatation of the optic sheet that represents a high ICB and you can you and you can manage your patient accordingly so it is non invasive it can give you a hint and you can monitor your patient pre and post tube management and see what is the variation and if you log your patient from day one until day uh, until discharge, so you know the better, and you can study this patient more uh, judiciously and know what's really the uh, physiology of this patient. Uh, the ICB, the only issue with the ICB monitoring is the, well, other than the infection. You cannot drain and you cannot uh, monitor at the same time. If you want to drain, you have to open the uh, cox. If you want the to monitor and have the monitoring, you will close. And that opening and the closing, it will cause intermittent. The problem, if you, by mistake, someone closed it for monitoring, for reading, and never opened, and that can lead to complication. Yeah, about the diffuse axonal injury. Uh, a diffuse axonal injury sometimes or most of the times the CT scan will be normal and your patient GCS is low. So there is no explanation why patient has a low GCS. And in that condition, you have two assumptions. Either patient is seizing, that's why you should ask for EEG, or your patient has diffuse axonal injury and you should ask for MRI. Diffuse axonal injury has three grades and uh, grade one, grade two, and grade three. Grade three is the most devastating grade and it is because it is involving the brainstem. Uh, grade one and two, they can have a, a better functional outcome with if they are young and with the time. So don't jeopardize your patient care. If they are young, uh, even if they have diffuse axonal injury type one or type two, with the time, they will improve. Diffuse axonal injury grade three or type three, they will have the more devastating because they are involving. They, it is involving the brain stem. The um, uh, so this is about the diffuse axonal injury contusions. You will see it more frequently in the temporal uh, lobe or frontal lobe, as Dr. Thabit mentioned, because of the close uh, contact with the bone. The frontal bone are the biggest bone and the temporal bone are the biggest bone of the uh, brain, uh, of the skull, I'm sorry. So any hit, it will cause the uh, brain to hit these bones and lead to contusions. Uh, the problem with the contusions, the, it's not the contusion itself, it's the edema around it. So the contusion can, the, ed the, the, the edema can be significantly uh, increasing with the days. So from day one to day, uh, you can see the difference between day one and day seven. You will see the, hem the hematoma of the contusion is dissolving and the edema is getting uh, bigger and bigger. So these are the things that you have to keep eye on, on when you are monitoring your patient.